Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. My kind of plan before I started the show was to talk about reincarnation, creation, the laws of creation, and the might of thoughts. And I saw that Daniel happened to be online and thought I would just drag him into this mess. And uh, maybe we'll start backwards and we'll we'll talk a little bit about the might of thoughts before we get into these other topics. Daniel, how are you today? Not too bad. Not too bad. It's a beautiful day here. <laughs> Finally getting it's some green blazing, trees and everything. So it's blazing hot here. It's like ninety degrees. Oh man. <laughs> Better you than me. Man, that would be awful. I can't take too much more than you, twenty degrees Celsius, so <laughs> now how much is twenty degrees Celsius? Ah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and no in idea. Fahrenheit, I don't Okay. Okay. I'd have to I'd have to go online and check. <laughs> I should always have my calculator ready when I'm talking about the weather. <laughs> yeah. I I want to I'm just curious. It's 68 Fahrenheit, 20 degrees. Celsius. Okay. There you go. Yeah, I can't take uh, much more than that. <laughs> you okay? And just so the listeners remember. You're in the Yukon Territory, which is way up there in Canada, right? Yeah, way, ne- way next to Alaska there. <laughs> so, yeah, we're uh, we're keeping it cold here as much as we can. So, keep well, the bugs and, down. And, and uh, this ties right into this ties right into my topic, one of my topics, because one thing I find. And you can correct me if you don't feel this way, because everyone's different. I find it most challenging to keep a positive attitude when it's winter. And you guys have huge winters, right? Yeah, there's a lot of depression in wintertime, I guess, especially because of the dark. And uh, especially, actually, in even further north, uh, northern communities where they actually have black for like six months. There's no sunlight. So, <laughs> so that that would be a little bit, uh, quite a bit more extreme than what we're used to here. I mean, we still have 24-hour daylight right now, but um, it's not oh, like do. the sun is up. Yeah, yeah, it just oh, goes see, below so the horizon a little bit, and then it comes up again. Yeah, yeah, it's a different you spot, know, different place, you know. It, it, it being there would be almost like being on another planet in some way. For yeah. me. <laughs> Yeah, well, I can just go up a mountain and that feel and feel that way. That's uh, it's like a mini holiday <laughs> from the craziness because there's so many different so, uh, little vegetational differences and everything. So yeah, but yeah, you're 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 telling me that you've got you're at the time every year where you have light all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's already uh, it's already 24 hour daylight now. You can get up at three in the morning and the light will be just like it'll be at uh you know four o'clock in the evening in in the winter so <laughs> so god yeah so, so, so the sun yeah. never completely goes down you you it don't just goes see below the sun the go down it just goes below the horizon but it's still like total daylight so it's uh it's not it's it's just like slightly darker but it's not dark like it's totally daylight like it's yeah <laughs> you just don't see the actual sun that's the only difference so it goes down in around uh in on the solstice it goes down probably around midnight and then it comes back up at like three in the morning or something so yeah it just goes I'll below the horizon just much. a little bit so yeah yeah totally and uh certainly uh put the hole in the whole uh in that whole theory of uh, the flat Earth crap, but uh, whatever. That's another story for another time. Oh, hey. So, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we we have to do a show on the flat Earth, man. I'm serious. Oh, got geez. to because mm. people, I mean, um, they come up with scenarios. I think with with valid questions. 
and some things don't make sense to them. But I, I think it's important to to try to resolve some of those issues. Uh, and, and not to ridicule people. But I, I tell you why I don't ridicule the flat earth people. Because they are independent thinkers. And that's what we got to mm-hmm. have. Eventually, mm-hmm. you know, if you're an independent thinker, you're going to evolve. But if you're not an independent mm-hmm. thinker, you're going to turn into a, a slug and you'll be exactly the way the elite want us to be, which is like sheep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well you know, that's well, the thing. That's the thing with the Meyer case too. It's uh it's or Galileo or any of those all of those people. They were they were independent thinkers for sure, but uh at least they were accurate. <laughs> well yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway. okay. Let's not beat up <laughs> don't get me started. We we cannot beat up on people. That's not what we're here for. <laughs> no, 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 no. Fair enough. I, 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 yeah, I hear what you're saying, but but I wanted to get back to the um, to the the whole idea of you guys not having. Right now, you have daylight all the time, but in the winter, it, in some places, it's like dark all the time, which is very much yeah. an easy. I mean, easy for me to get depressed in the winter here, which would probably be like almost like spring to you. So Mm -hmm. I wanted to, let let me, this is something I was reading in the Might of Thoughts, and for there's always a new listener, so I want to just bring this out. Billy Meyer is an 81-year-old man in Switzerland. He's written over 50 books. I think they're the greatest source of wisdom on the planet. One of these books is called The Might of Thoughts, which is Mach der Gedanken in the German. And one of the things I read yesterday Reread because I'm constantly reading this book. It says optimism is a prerequisite for constancy in life, and I don't think I'm truly an optimist yet because I'm not constant. In other words, it's saying here that uh, optimism is a prerequisite for being a truly stable. Person, I don't think I'm there yet as far as optimism. It's something I'm working on. Do you have any comments? Well, I guess we're all working on that. Right? <laughs> we're still alive, so we haven't uh, decided to take our own lives yet, or at least most of us. And uh, so we're, yeah, I think that's a sense of optimism in some ways, but uh, in many cases, well, it was for me. So I know that much because I had gone now, through that, and it was. Yeah. You, you, as you were young, had kind of a crisis in those air, in that area, right? In terms of mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. When you exactly. when you were doing your calculations, what you call your calculations? Go ahead. Yeah, exactly, and uh, that was my form of dealing with the negativity that I was witnessing in the world, and uh, realizing that I didn't have any control over. You know, I could maybe influence slightly. You know, some of the ways the world is going, but I can't really change it. You know completely <laughs> that's for sure so you know yeah when I was in my really downtime, like between 9 and 21 years old I was suicidal I thought about it every day and I thought about you know ah. not wanting to live basically and so it was really hard to live with and but you know that was I, I just I, I realized like looking at the negative and looking to it so that you get through it you know, like, so that mm-hmm. it wasn't meant to rhyme, sorry, <laughs> but uh, looking to it, looking at it, like, in a sense, like, you're, you're really looking at it, you're really examining every angle that you can possibly figure out about what you're going through in your, in your mind, and so on, and what's, what's the challenge here, and so forth, and really going towards it, and really examining every angle, so that you get through it, you get through it, and you find the solution in the end, that's, that's, you know, a sense of optimism that I think is quite healthy. Um, if I had just started, you know, trying to ignore it or um, <clears throat> trying to cover it up with, uh, you know, smiles or drugs or whatever it might be, alcohol, mm-hmm. just, just trying to party hardy and all that kind of stuff, I would have died for sure. So there's uh, no question there. And so, because I would still mm. be stuck in the same mental state that I was back then. But because I worked through it, um, I knew that there would be a solution. Um, it's just that, you know, it's hard to find in our world because our world is so led by 
materialistic people and ideas and old, you know, pretty antiquated thoughts and ideas and so forth about how things work uh, or don't work, I should say. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it's, you know, examining all those aspects in terms of putting some sort of a framework together in the end in terms of getting through that and in a logical um, way. Uh, that's the most important thing because if it's not logical, if it doesn't actually work, if it's not functional, then you can't you can't rely on that, you know, on a subconscious level and your depression will stay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's uh, something you have to do every day, you know, working out problems and uh, it's a neutral positive perspective. It's not just positive, it's not just negative. You have to look at the negative 100% and you have to look at the positive 100% equally. Because if you only look at the positive, then you create you create negatives as well, right? So you kind of thwart yourself because you're making uneducated decisions or you're making educated or decisions based on something that's not real, that's not sustainable. So so yeah. What uh, what I did go ahead. What when I was going through the the Might of Thoughts book, I I I took notes on like the big areas. Like he talked about Billy talked about being confident. For example, that's one area that I I'm also working on self confidence and and the the feeling of trusting your own abilities, your own qualities, and your own judgment. And so, but mm-hmm. there's a whole slew of them. There's confidence, optimism. I tell myself I am confident. I am optimistic. I am cheerful. I am relaxed. I'm enthusiastic. I'm thankful. I'm in harmony. I persist. I persevere. I endure. I'm calm. I'm satisfied. And just going through that starts a little bit. It's like a tiny step in the right direction. Just a little tiny step. So yeah. anyway, that's what I've I've done. Yeah, exactly, and you have to do that. I mean, when I was starting to form my framework, which was a framework to find this particular case, like when when they would come public, I mean, which, which year and which country, that uh, was basically what the framework was supposed to identify. Um, I When I first started going through this process, I would question myself because, you know, a lot of people don't think about these things or they're it's just not in the academic world even um a lot of the i mean it is because it, all the aspects of it are um very easily identifiable by any academia anywhere and so it's it, you can't deny it on that level but it's still i was questioning myself you know and so i thought about galileo galileo has been like my favorite historical figure for a long time because of his struggle against sort of the main head honchos at the time who were completely against him and his discoveries or whatever. So, but, you mm-hmm. know, he, he, he allowed himself to examine, to question, to see from his own eyes, to make his own measurements. And that, you know, despite what other people thought about them and or didn't think about them that's more important like more importantly <laughs> what was going on there because people weren't examining anything that he was talking about they just wanted to believe whatever they wanted to believe and that was it so um so he challenged all that and uh, finally uh, you know 500 years later the catholic church finally said oh well you know it's uh <laughs> it, what he was saying was true, you know, and so it's uh, that, that that's just you have to allow yourself the ability to you have to give yourself. It's not so much a confidence, maybe it is a self confidence. I don't know, but it's you have to allow yourself the privilege or give yourself the privilege to to just not worry too much what other people will think in terms of your your hypotheses because these at the time for me were just hypotheses they weren't conclusions they were not um they were just theories on my on, in my head you know and so i i couldn't conclude that they were accurate at the time but i could really work out the probability that you know they were probably very likely in in many respects and so on so um so allowing yourself to question to to go into 
your own senses and actually see what you can figure out for yourself and not just believe what somebody else tells you. I think that's so, sort of a confidence. Yeah. Let me let me steer us back to Galileo for a minute. Galileo, uh, I think he was born in 1564. Um, he was he was really the person that got us into modern science, and he was the person that argued for a heliocentric view of our solar system. In other words, saying that the sun is the center of our solar system and not the earth. Now, this was totally against the church and the church's thinking, correct? Yeah, exactly. And so they put him under house arrest for continuously reasserting his, his research <laughs> for right. the rest of his life, I guess it was. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty serious thing to be stuck in your house your whole life. I wonder who got him food, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, who knows? I mean, it's just, it's just, but that's underlying the, what our society is still struggling with, you know? And so, I mean. It is. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, for me, when I was a little kid, you know, starting out with all this stuff, I thought, Who's Galileo of today? You know, because that's like the ultimate question, right? That gets you really thinking outside of what everyone's telling you is true. And so you're actually forced then to use his methods, to use the scientific method, basically, to make your own conclusions about what you see in the universe, what you see in the world, what you see in, in, your, in your own consciousness, in your own ability to deal with things and so forth. So, so I think that's huge. Well, let me also say that, and I didn't realize this, that uh, Galileo, was, he was called the father of astronomy, which I can understand that, but he was also called the father of modern physics, the father of the scientific method, the father of science. I didn't realize mm. he was looked at in that high esteem. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the turning point, I think, in history where, you know, things started to go down this road for us, and I think we owe everything to to Galileo for this, and uh, I think that's you know a huge, huge um, uh, improvement. <laughs> I guess. And, and and what's really cool about this is this leads me right into my my other topic. One of the topics I wanted to talk about was reincarnation. Correct. We. Mm -hmm. We know the spirit form that was residing in Galileo is the same spirit form that incarnated in Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, Muhammad, Rasputin, Socrates, Edward Albert Meyer, Socrates, so continue, yeah. Aristotle, yeah, Mendelssohn, Mozart. <laughs> so isn't and that on and on. Yeah. phenomenal? Isn't that phenomenal? It's not, it's not surprising. It's not surprising for me at all. When I started uh, looking, you know, because I started being a musician quite young and so forth, I thought, to me, the most important thing that could actually improve the music in this world would actually be the spirit teaching. Um, because, and just improving our, our, our view of ourselves and our relationship to the universe. Um, because right now, in our world, that's pretty pretty skewed it's pretty almost non-existent and uh and our music really demonstrates that it really shows that right now in our world and so i found um that these musicians must have had some very deep understanding on a on a very subconscious level on how this all kind of works and ties together because the purpose and the work that they had to put into it you know it's just a huge amount of effort and to do that just for no reason, it's just ridiculous. So I just thought, well, you know, if you're going to make beautiful art and meaningful art and meaningful music that actually <sighs> celebrates our connection and our connection, well, yeah, our connection to the universe, our interaction with the universe and our discovering and uncovering of the secrets of the universe, well... I think music plays a huge part in that in art and everything as well. So I think it's 
these people must have had some inclination about that. And, uh, you know, they might have had different wording for it at the time, but I think the meaning they were trying to convey might have been quite similar. And I know Galileo, you know, probably wasn't too Christian, <laughs> uh, you know, because it was a Catholic church that was really against him at the time. And, um, and he had his own observations. And so he probably had a deep, you know, understanding already of, of, of what the universe, that it's larger than us, that it's, you know, the, it's just there to be discovered, you know, and nobody can claim <laughs> from some book that had no scientists involved of any kind um, that uh, they would know all the secrets of the universe, especially if they were condoning things like slavery and everything else. So, <laughs> so yeah. Let, let me read so, something here. Um, along the lines of our discussion here, it says, uh, Galileo defended his views in this writing called Dialogue Concerning concerning the two chief world systems, which appeared to attack one of the popes, who was the pope then, thus alienated him and the, and the Jesuits, who he kind of attacked too, who had, up to this point, the Jesuits even had supported Galileo. But when, when he wrote this dialogue concerning the two world systems, even the Jesuits stepped away from him. And Galileo was tried by the Inquisition. He was found to be suspect of heresy and forced to recant. And like you said, he spent the rest of his life under house arrest. And this was a guy that really paid a big price for his, his point of views. And I want to get back to Galileo and reincarnation, but I wanted to ask you a quick question here. It's a little bit of a tangent. You are mm -hmm. are you what's called a passive passive member of the FIGU group? Yeah, I became a passive member. Yeah, it's just uh, you know you get to to read all the things in paper. Basically, <laughs> a lot of the stuff you can read online too. And uh, I think I don't know. It's just I go there and I help once in a while uh, in, in Switzerland and. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just enjoyable to meet the other people who also take this interest and so forth. So I think it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you and, imagine, uh, let, me put a, let me put a frame around our discussion here so people listening to the archive will understand what we're talking about. The Meyer teaching talks about the Nocodamian lineage and a reincarnating spirit form over thousands of years here on the earth. And we recognize that spirit form to be the same spirit form that's currently residing in Edward Albert Meyer, correct? Yeah, and, um, you know, people might not be able to grasp that, really. <laughs> you know, that's that's just why I made my, my framework in the first place, because I made the framework as a way to identify where this case is and where they came public. And I think that's hugely important. Um, and I did that years before I found the case, before I found Meyer or any of this information. Um, and so it's, it, yeah, it takes, you know, personal thought and, and whatever to, to get through all that. And it, it's really difficult because, you know, a lot of the same people or same organizations that are in power, that were in power during Galileo's time are still in power today and still calling the shots basically politically now and so on and so forth too. And so it's, uh, it's very difficult for people to really identify this sort of thing if they're not really thinking outside the box and, um, you know, just questioning things on their most fundamental level uh, that we take for granted. So, um, yeah, I, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to, uh, to convey, you know, that aspect of it to people. And I, knew that I was looking for <laughs> the Galileo of today. I didn't think of it, you know, quite that literally, though, when I started doing it. And that's the funny thing, because, you know, when I was seven, I started to set up on this, on this, I thought, well, you know, who's the Galileo of today? That was like my question back then. And um, when I was nine, I started realizing that, you know, the codex and all the stuff that, you know, brings people back into this mission over lifetimes and so on. And then by the time I was 15, I finished the framework. And then by the time I was 23 or so, I found the actual 
contacts that the framework was supposed to identify. So, yeah, like, I don't know, I was on a train of thought there. Oh, yeah, like, finding the Galileo of today, right? Like, how... <laughs> I didn't think of it would it would be so literal, you know, and so I I just wanted to identify the people that are actually challenging the world in the same way that he did, and that's all I wanted to do, and so that's what Billy is de- doing today, and um, you know through all the research that you can do about it through UFOs and trying to you know identify things scientifically um, based on that and so on and so forth. So and it goes against the UFO community completely. So it's a uh, very difficult to identify in that respect too because you won't find this in ufo conferences or anything like that and uh and so <laughs> yet it has the most physical evidence the most you know any kind of evidence that you can find in any any ufo case so it's uh by far like by light years it's just huge so yeah so the um the the one i want to step back a little bit because you were talking about the power structure today and how the power structure is still in many ways the same as it was in Galileo's time. And I heard Dr. Bruce Lipton talk about the Jesuits and the fact that he said the Jesuits know that if you can take a child from the ages of one to seven and program him with religious doc- doctrines, that he will pretty much be indoctrinated for his whole life because it creates these subconscious patterns, these subconscious downloads of information that play all the time. So Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could comment on that. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, uh, that's, you know, people, it's it's funny because even people who say they're scientific are not in many cases because they're, they're just regurgitating what they, what they heard in high school or in mm-hmm. university and, and they're not questioning it. They're not thinking about it in terms of how did they actually come to conclude this? <laughs> they're just saying, I memorized this for a test. This must be the truth. And that's, just not scientific. I'm sorry. You, it is a science class. It might be accurate information, but if you don't know how that information came to be, you're still in the dark. And so people come to this case in the same method. Um, and people like these people who are, you know, really not interested in having this kind of a case be public uh, or known, um, do take initiative in their own respects to create, you know. Um, their own opinions, and they put them online and say, oh, well, this is my opinion of the case, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And they miss completely vital information, on purpose, of course. Um, And (laughs) it's just so unscientific most of the time, and you're just thinking, well, what the hell? I mean, like, geez, you really, you can't rely on anybody's opinion. You can't even rely on Meyer's opinion on this stuff. You have to rely on your own research, and because it's just so fraught with with dangers, you know, like anybody who has an interest in, in, in diverting anybody away from this case who who has something to lose, you know, uh, usually it's money or political power or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, um, will do whatever they can to, to thwart people in their efforts. So the best thing to do is just never listen to anybody's opinion about it. Only do your own research. <laughs> And that's what most people don't know how to do. They don't know how to do it. And I I found this, you know, earlier on when I was still, you know, into just researching the case myself and so on. The first few years, I was obviously excited about it and telling, you know, my friends about it, which is a stupid thing to do. But, hey, you know, it's just a natural inclination, of course. (laughs) And so, but, you know, I thought, you know, these people did well in school and so on, so they must have some scientific understanding, but no, there was nothing. There was really, they would just look for, they would cherry pick for whatever somebody's opinion on this and somebody's opinion on that without really looking at it and thinking, Oh my gosh, like, like that was what they based their opinions on. And it's just exactly like what they did in high school. It's exactly what they did in university. And so it's, it's really strange to me. 
Well, let, let me pick is, back up. That's the power structures. Sorry. Go let ahead. me pick back up with with what you were saying. Back, I'm getting a lot of background noise. Are you moving around or? I'm uh, hearing it's just huge background noise. I'm sorry. No? It's probably because I'm moving around too much here. Yeah. Here, I'll take my shoes off. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I got my head. Are you walking? Off, so I can't hear anything. No, uh, no. You're I'm walking. In, uh, no. No, I'm just. Uh, I got my. I'm in a tiny little room here, and I'm just kind of moving around a bit. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just wonder what was going on. I. I um. What what I was going to talk about is is that Galileo studied the creation, and this is a very important conceptual thing in the Meyer information. Uh, and I think one of the guy that does the best description of what the creation is is a guy named Michael Uderbrook, who is in Figu, Canada, and he he talks about the creation not being a god, not being a father figure. It's absolutely without gender. It has both positive and negative and complete equality. The creation is neutral. And its power and wisdom are the greatest in our universe. So we have a, we have a physical universe and we have a kind of a super intelligence which is evolving and driving the evolution of our universe. Uh, I just wondered if you could comment on that, uh, Daniel, and how that is so different than the notion of a of a God the Father type figure. Yeah, well, that was one of the questions that spurred me onto this whole framework too um, when I was building it, because you know my mother would bring me to church every Sunday and all that kind of stuff, and I just every time I was there I just thought, man, this is so ridiculous. Because it just didn't make it just didn't make any sense on a on any logical perspective. So, um it's uh totally different. Like you're you're thinking here about an actual energy in the universe and we know from physics on the most basic level that everything is energy. And consciousness is also a form of energy and it's probably a more refined form of energy. Um and our scientists will eventually, you know, of course, figure out um, what consciousness really is, you know, in terms of the actual energy force of it. Um, right now, we can identify what it does, I think, um, but we don't really know exactly what it is. And so on the, on the scientific level, in our world anyways. And so, um, so you know, we're, we're, we're scratching the surface on that. And, um, but I think that's a completely different thing than somebody, you know, barking out orders and telling you, well, you know, do this or I'll kill you and all this kind of stuff. So it's, <laughs> which is what you see a lot of in the Bible. Um, and so, you know, do this or you're going to hell or do this or you're going to heaven or whatever. I don't know, whatever. It's just, uh, all this kind of stuff. Right. And, uh, it doesn't promote, um, evolution of your consciousness at all. It only promotes fear and you're just doing something out of fear. Like saying, well, you go to the bank and there's a bank robber there and he says, well, you should help him or else he'll shoot you. Well, okay. That's doing something out of fear. That's not doing something for the right reasons, you know? And um, and so when you actually do something or you learn how to do something for the right reasons, for, you know, why the cause and effect of, of every action that you take and so on is, is really, that's the chain reaction that you're, you're studying, you're learning about, and, and we're all learning about, and um, hopefully. And so um, that is more the creational sort of energy, and we can come back, you know, not we, but, you know, our spirit form comes back in another body and another personality, you know, after we die, our personality dies with the body and the brain and, uh, and so on. And, uh, it comes back to the planet where, or closest to where it died. And, um, and, uh, and then it continues sort of learning through its physical experiences and so on and so forth. And then when it, when it dies um. again, the spirit detaches and then, learns or sort of digests the information sort of like a dream cogitation state and uh, and then before it comes back and then it comes back again and again and again until we're you know evolving to a point where we don't need the, the physical anymore but that'll be a long long time before that happens and uh, uh, daniel millions of years let me interrupt you just let me interrupt you just for a second here 
because my I'm getting some callers that are calling in, <laughs> and I got a couple oh, okay. callers that are waiting <laughs> waiting to talk. So I'm going to mute good. you. I'm going to play just a little bit of my birds chirping for a minute, and then I'm going to take good. one of these calls. So we're going to take like a 20 second break, folks, and we'll be right back. Okay, folks, welcome back. You're listening to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. My guest today is Daniel Cooper. We're talking about the Meyer information, and I got a couple callers that called in. And uh, Let me see who's got the longest hold time. So I'm going to bring on 818. If your prefix is 818, be heads up. We're going to bring you on the air now. So... Um, it will take a second. Here we go. Caller, um, hey, Ohio Exopolitics. What's your name, sir? Greet is in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is Pastor Don Jr., CEO of the Entertainment Worldwide Network, calling from sunny Mesa, Arizona. The time is now 10.06. The call-in number is 917-889-7099. Uh, Mr. Mark Schneider, I love what you're doing, and I love what the brother just said, and I, I want to make a comment on it. Um, a lot of times in church, people are so in tune to the actual physical walls it's not they're not in tune to the spirit that's in the church. Uh some of the churches you go into, you can tell the spirit because the energy is that they're from the ushers, they don't smile at you, they don't say hi, they say, Here's a program. They'll say, Hey, welcome to our church. We're so glad you're here. And from that point forward, your whole experience is off from the initial meeting. So everything is spirit, wind and energy. And when I say spirit, I'm saying the uh the spirit never leaves the earth and we decompose as we decompose we give our nutrients and stuff back to the earth and they it turns and has a chemical reaction which comes in the physical but as us being human beings the power of free will we can bring stuff from the spiritual world into the physical world henceforth birth so i just uh i'm just amazed at what y'all bringing out in the show i do believe in the father son and holy spirit but i also believe in the laws of gravity if i jump in front of a train i will be ran over and uh <laughs> y'all are on fire man i, I got my winning team here you know we i had to call the team in because this is a topic because i want to really see uh it's 300 winning team members we all come from different backgrounds of life we got pastors preachers gangsters doctors lawyers judges disciples all kinds of different people but if we don't have these healthy conversations to put it out on an open platform put it out on the new time capsule which is called the cloud people won't be able to hear about this 50 to 100 years from now. So this is priceless information knowledge. Once again, y'all, the call-in number is 917-889-7099. Call in, press 1, get involved. If you're not recorded in this moment in time, you will miss your opportunity to be recorded in history. I am Pastor Don Jr., CEO. I'm right here, my brother Mark. How are you feeling today? Uh, Pastor, how, how, how do you spell your first name? I just wanted to make sure I understood you. D O N space J R space C E O. It all goes together, and we live in a world now where people Google it. If you Google Pastor Don, you're gonna see a white guy. I'm a black guy, <laughs> you know. I want to make sure you get the right person. So Pastor Don Junior C E O is all together. But okay. uh, yeah, that, that's me, man. I just I love what Thanks y'all for doing. Calling here, and I love that y'all keeping it real. Okay, I'm, I'm standing by, right, brother. I, please don't hang me up. I'm, I'm be on mute, but I'm right here. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll put you on mute for just a while there, and it'll take just a second as it transitions into mute. I'm going to bring on the next caller, 361. 
Hello, caller. Tell us tell us your name and where you're calling in from. Hey, what's going on? Appreciate that, man. Yes. That, hello? Hello, this is Mark hello? Snyder from Ohio, Ohio Exopolitics, and we got you on the air. So if you have a comment or a what's question, please on? throw it out there. We're All doing right, good. How are on, you? Mark? How are you doing? Good, good. Appreciate doing great. everything. Uh, for letting me be on the call. Uh, my name is uh, Vic Styles down here in Florida. Um, Pastor Don sent me a message. So I had to call in. You know what I'm saying? Pastor Don, CEO. Saying his name okay. correct on this show. Pastor Don, CEO, put me on to this. It's your boy Vic Styles. Um, appreciate it. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, blog talk, family. And you're, and you're, I consider blog. I, I've done blog talk before. I'm still connected with blog talk. So I'm also blog talk family as well, but um, I mostly do team music radio. I'm down here in Florida, but I'm originally from New York, okay. so I'm up in Florida and New York. So definitely, I just want to, you know, give praise and say what's up to you and uh, appreciate oh. everything you let me uh, be on the call uh, this evening with y'all. Happy Memorial Day and blessings to you and your family. Well, thank you. Thank you. And how did you meet uh, Pastor Don? He's in Arizona and you're in Florida. <laughs> Uh, social media, Facebook. Is that right? Facebook, Facebook, and Instagram. Okay, and, and your name is Vic, and you're from Florida, Vic, right? Vic Styles, yes, DJ Vic Styles. Oh, and you're a DJ. Yes, sir. At a radio station, or? Yeah, two of them. I have Blog Talk Radio and Team Music Radio. But right now, I'm just Very... focusing on one right now. So I do that. A and R Talent Scout. Uh, just joined for uh, actually I'm part of four companies: TDM Worldwide, FMBMC, DJ Crew, School of Hard Knocks, and uh, now Team Music Radio. So I got a whole bunch of companies I'm working with, and uh, I'm trying to keep everything in one circle and bless Man, everybody. Man, that sounds interesting. It's hard. Try to take care of that and the family. Oh God. <laughs> Try to make your wife happy, the kids and mom happy, oh, yeah. and then make your make your musical people happy and your companies happy. It's, oh, yeah, I feel like I'm in a circus. I need to juggle. Yeah, <laughs> I gotta juggle. So definitely, well, thanks I want to say thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll stay tuned. I'll listen. So I appreciate you having me on okay. the line, Mark. Appreciate it. And I want to say this quick: right. everybody that's listening, everybody that's listening, follow my man Mark on Blog Talk Radio. Um, he's in Ohio. Let y'all know. Let him. He's doing his thing. Blessings to him, his radio show, and his family. Y'all need to check him out. Y'all need to call in, get the information from Pastor Don and Mark as well, and we'll get it from there. Thank you and blessings. Uh, thanks, Vic. I'm going to bring my guest back on now. As soon as this, and I hopefully this is uh, Daniel. Is this still? Uh, <laughs> do yeah. I have you? Back that is on I. Howdy. Okay, we've got. <laughs> I've got two other callers on the line. If you guys just want to listen, that's great. If you want to um, participate, press one. And I've got my two other callers that they were just on the air that I've got them on mute right now. So, uh, wow. You know what's interesting? Um, well, a lot of things are interesting about this. Daniel, why don't you just comment? I'm sure something popped into your mind while those fellows called in. Yeah. Oh, it's nice to know that people actually listen to this show. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm it just is. Such a, I, I'm, I, like I say, like you know, it's, it's one thing to have confidence, but you know, I got, uh, I always had my self-esteem issues. So, <laughs> well, so, we were talking never, about uh, optimism, optimism, yeah. right? And that mm-hmm. optimism is a prerequisite for being consistent in life, and what goes hand in hand with optimism. I think is self confidence, and these are two mm-hmm. areas that I'm I'm also working on because I realize more and more that I'm not as confident as I thought I was, and I'm not as <laughs> optimistic as I thought I was. Especially when I look out into the world, and it looks so crazy, you know. But still, I've got to have confidence yeah. that we can meet a good end, that we don't want to mm-hmm. lose that like conviction. That. You, you know, I've got another caller here. I'm going to go ahead and bring on it. the air here. Okay, we will do. I'll put you on mute just for a second, Daniel. And here we go. And this is uh, 361. 
And I'm bringing 361. You are on the air. Ohio Exopolitics. This is Mark Snyder speaking with you. How are you? I'm good. This is uh, Vic Styles again. You put me back oh, on air. Oh, oh. Sorry, sorry. All right. Are you good? Let me hang. Okay. All right. I should have wrote these numbers down. I got three numbers here. Hopefully this yeah, this is going quite. 214, did I have you been on the air before? Uh no sir, I have not. I just wanted to give a quick I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the room. Uh my name is Rob Williams. I'm from Dallas, Texas. Uh I'm a friend of uh, Pastor Don Green Jr. who just called a little bit earlier. Don Don Jr. CEO. Definitely follow what he's talking about. Uh, I have my own podcast for issue-based podcast for social activism and political commentary. It's called Roundtable. You can check us out on yeah. Facebook at yeah. at Facebook. Go on Facebook.com slash GCC Prod or Gary Charlie Charlie P O R D. And uh, our 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 most recent episode, our most recent project uh, was for because I, I'm also a veteran. I was in the you know the U.S. Navy for four years. OEF OIF. And, um, you, you know, today, today really means something to me because over the weekend I went to a conference, the Veteran uh, Cannabis Forum. We're trying to push through on marijuana here in the States, and not just in, in Texas, but all over the country. Because, I mean, whether the state decides to reform, and I mean, I like, I like that, you know, your topic is optimism and confidence because it's going to tie into uh-huh. what I have to say. Mm-hmm. Whether, the, whether the states decide they want to go ahead and, and overturn the laws and you in 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 uh, and, uh what was the word I'm looking for and and pull and, and pull out the Tenth Amendment. We're still we still need to be talking about this in a separate dimension with the veterans. We served all 50 states, include and Puerto Rico. So if I want to go to Puerto mm-hmm. Rico and roll a blunt, mm-hmm. that's what I should be able to do. Now I know we got I got to have a little more of a. I believe also that, that, that the military has given me a very assertive and forceful tone, and I know that a lot of us, especially in my generation, we, can't, we, we don't communicate that well. I know I don't like being talked to in any kind of ways, but I think when it comes to marijuana, when it comes to cannabis, when it comes to hemp, and when it comes to that issue, I think we need more confidence and we need more optimism in areas like red states, in areas where it's really racist, because I don't think that if, if we're willing to – like, if there's anything I want people to pull out on Memorial Day – I want them to know that I, I don't I don't I don't buy into the the, uh, the traditional narrative. Oh, thank you for your service. Thank you for so today is not even for that. Today is for the men and women who died, the men and women who mm-hmm. didn't come back home, mm-hmm. the men and women who probably killed themselves because they came back from war not like people think. War doesn't create winners, you know. And mm-hmm. the thing is, to, today mm-hmm. today is the day to remember them, but also. You know, in my in, in my mind, you know, mother always my mother always raised me to believe if if you know better, do better. You know, if we know that veterans are homeless, if we know that veterans are killing themselves in America every day, every week, every year, then what are we doing to reduce that? And how much harder can we are, are we going to work to reduce that? That that's that's where my head's at with with optimism and and, and confidence. But that's just one topic. Over the weekend, the Cannabis Forum, we talked about that. We had, some, we had multiple stories from multiple different vets from multiple different generations. Uh, you can definitely go check, check out our, our, uh, our, our short documentary over it all on, on GCC Productions, yeah. uh, same website, yeah. facebook.com forward slash GCCPROD. Um, it, it, like I said, uh, the, we pride ourselves on being – progressive and upwardly mobile and motivated at all times. I mean, change is hard, but if we're going to pay taxes, then we need to take ownership in the country that we live in. Well, let, let me throw one thing in here, because some of the research I've done, and you can jump in here anywhere, is like cannabis, marijuana has some very, very important health effects, correct? Correct. Could you elaborate well, well, on that a little bit? Because when, you, when, you say, when you say health effects, well, what are we talking about? Well, I have heard that uh, you can – isn't there like an oil that comes from cannabis that, that you can just take and you don't, you don't get high at all, but it has some very beneficial effects for your body from what I remember? Is that true? 
CBD oil I, or I something they call it. I don't want to be the expert on marijuana, on okay. cannabis in general, uh, but but okay. there is mm-hmm. CBD is a is is a strong. I believe that's one of the main elements in hemp. And it's in it's in mm-hmm. marijuana as well, but mm-hmm. the, the difference between marijuana and hemp is THC. And yes, there there mm-hmm. is there is oil, there is a CBD oil, there is a C, I don't know if that, if I'm saying it right to call it oil, but an extract mm-hmm. that does have medical effects that that, that can help pa- patients with arthritis. You know what I mean? Patients with you know with Alzheimer's. You know what I mean? Well, well I mean maybe not necessarily the oil, but the, the remedy, the hemp, the medicine, the byproduct that can be made from hemp, you know, and then, of course, cannabis, it, you know, however you can get it in your body, it, it'll make a difference. But, you know, we already know that it makes a difference in paraplegics, at least in, in there, in there in, in, like myself, you know, uh, veterans that have, that have depression or PTSD, you know, anxiety, mood, mood disorders, you know what I mean? Uh, ultimately, this plant can do, can only, can, I'm convinced. You know, I, I started to question when I was in high school, you know, before I served, but now definitely after service, after living life for a few years, like I, I'm beyond, you know, I'm beyond any of the any of the reefer madness, quote unquote, that people have. Like the idea is, you know, we need to touch, we, we need to touch on why I feel like, I personally feel like if we touch on the fact that the first drug czar was quoted as saying, reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. I think we need to call out some of the racism, and we also need to call out some of the inconsistencies that have existed in government to keep – I mean, we have to remember, you know, the fact that it even got the term marijuana was because Mexicans were bringing it over the border. They were trying to associate it with a culture that was evil. And, you know, the culture really itself wasn't evil. The idea is you have, you have all of these poor people that, need, that, need to, that want to stop being poor, that are basically refugees, that they, in exchange for riding with a truck driver that's carrying a truck full of marijuana, he'll help you get a seat, you and your family, a seat over the border into an area where you can make 15 k a year and ultimately get nowhere with your life, but at least live in America. And see, there's too many different inconsistencies and dimensions with cannabis that had just outright lies, like the UDC, just outright lies because you, you hate the fact that you lost the Civil War. You know, these people, like, are literally lying to, to you know, they're, they're, there's just been generations of lying. And as we've seen with all of the states that exist so far that have changed, in Texas is included, they just aren't, aren't where they need to be with, with reform. But all the states that have reformed, have, have created medical legalization or recreational full-out legalization, they see it. They see it in the money. They see it in society. Yes, there's still crime. Yes, there's still problems. Yes, there's people who try to go overboard. It, I mean, they said the same thing about alcohol, didn't they? Yeah, of course, we're gonna have, they thought we were going to have a drunk America. And yes, we still had criminals. <laughs> yes, we still have people that drink and drive. But at the end of the day, no one said, okay, let's bring prohibition back. Right, right. Well, your name was Rob, correct? Yes, sir. I just want to make sure I got your first name, and I appreciate you calling in. And you really had some really good points to bring up. So thanks again for calling in. I really appreciate uh, all these uh, excellent callers we've had today. So I'm going to put you back on mute just for a little bit and bring Daniel back here. Daniel, this has been very interesting. Um, had a lot of interesting comments, a lot of interesting uh, discussion there, and I think I think the importance of being optimistic and being confident and being cheerful and being relaxed and being enthusiastic and being thankful and being in harmony is very very critical. And this is, I think, something that you know, basic things mm-hmm. that all people can benefit from correct yeah exactly well he was bringing up uh you know some of the stuff about the veterans and things too i imagine you know a lot of P- ptsd uh, post-traumatic stress dis- uh, stress disorders um this seems to be happening quite a bit even in canada and uh and elsewhere and i mean i can imagine you know being in a war zone and uh or maybe i can't you know like, but you know just what would go through my mind if i saw a bunch of people killed or or killed a bunch of people oh, yeah. himself, or who knows what, you know? So, I mean, that, uh, I think that would be, 
you know quite a bit to to manage consciously if you're if you're not ready to deal with it or if you don't have the tools or if you don't have you know whatever and even then you know it's it's still a monumental task so i i think uh you know, there's probably a lot of suicides, and uh, you do hear about it in the news, even in Canada. And uh, and so, yeah, I certainly don't uh, condone the wars or anything like that. And uh, I, you know, when they say support our troops, I, I often what I hear is support our wars. But uh, what I really want to <laughs> would rather put stress on is uh, you know actually supporting the people who are coming back from these places because that's. Uh, horror you know and uh, I guess it was on MASH or something on the TV show and uh, they were I, I guess it was Hawkeye Pierce the, the the main doctor there and he was talking to the priest and he was like well which do you think is worse uh, hell or war and I guess he was saying well I guess war is, is worse because you know who do you find in, in hell well sinners well who do you find in wars innocent bystanders, you know, kids, children, whatever, anybody. So <laughs> so I think uh, to me that made good sense. <laughs> so, you, you, uh, you know, the, the Meyer information doesn't really, um, I mean, there are different philosophies. You know, some people believe in a literal devil, a literal, literal Satan, and, thing. And, and the Meyer information maybe doesn't go there, but I will say this much, the elite who are in control of this world, I think they do believe in a Satan. And I think that they, these wars are literal blood sacrifices that some of these groups are making. And I, and I, and I think these bankers who are running the earth here um, are the ones that are manipulating these wars and continuing this whole war thing. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, who knows what they believe, but it must be pretty crazy to want to continue all this stuff. So, um, yeah. Can you uh, imagine? Yeah. Well, why would uh, why would anybody want to kill someone else like that? I mean, it's just such a ridiculous thing to think about. But uh, that's just, you know, the world that some people are born into sometimes. Or, I don't know. I don't know. It's... Uh, Many, many different uh, ideas and philosophies and things, of course, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of it leads to very destructive patterns, and uh, we're certainly seeing that in our world, and that's certainly something that needs to be fixed, and uh, at least reined in, you know, because who are the most free people in our world is the craziest people, and who are the least free people in the world is the most peaceful ones, so, (laughs) So, you know, I was doing a little research. The other day, Jeff Bezos, the guy that owns Amazon, I was reading somewhere that he makes three thousand one hundred and twenty-eight dollars per second. Per second. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. Imagine I was just that. reading this morning. I was just reading this morning that his employees have to pee in a bottle just to not make make sure they don't take uh, you know bathroom breaks and all that kind of stuff. So just because it's so ridiculously absurd, you know, like they're basically slaves. They, so uh, seriously, they don't take bathroom breaks. Seriously. No, no. That's so, yeah, no. It's, uh, in the United thing States, been I mean, in the U.S. Well, I guess is it, that true? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, oh this uh, this company is getting a very, <laughs> very bad reputation for the way it treats its its uh, its employees. So I don't think uh, I don't even know why. I don't know. It's just it's a weird it's a weird thing. Like, why can people live like that and know that you know? And uh, they have they're starting to you know come up with these uh, chips and all these kind of things that they put into their employees to make sure that they don't, you know, whatever. They're, they're just robots, basically. And I just think, wow, that's so dehumanizing. So, I don't know. So, um, I'm going to read something here that Billy has to say about optimism. He says, but if there is no optimism, and if it is not created, then no progress can be achieved because... The thoughts are inevitably weak, and in their powerlessness they collapse, which has the further effect that purely physical weakness also appears. So a lack of optimism can literally also affect your body. Isn't that astonishing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess most... So uh, it's the the power of our thoughts. 
the power of our thoughts are so incredible. Um, mm-hmm. but what does Billy say? He says, I am the forger of my own fortune. I'm the creator of my own good luck. You know, he says, good thoughts create good feelings. Good feelings also eventually produce good habits. Good habits help to create good circumstances in your life. And that we are the master of our own destinies. We are the forger of our own fortune. We create our, our own good luck. Isn't that a phenomenal thing to know that you have that kind of power inside you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's one thing I kept on holding on to when I was suicidal. And uh, that's why I was able to make the calculations, for example, you know, the whole framework. And uh, so that's um, that's the one thread all the way through that, was that sort of knowing that I will probably, at least I'm able to, to pull myself through it. Um, so it's, uh, that's, yeah, exactly. And that's, it's very difficult. There's no question about that. There's no ambiguity about that. There, you know, it's, it's difficult, but, but it's worth it because in the end you have, you know, peace of mind and in the end you can start creating actually good results and so on and so forth. And, uh, so yeah, I agree. I, I wanted to also step back. We, we started to to talk a little bit about the universal consciousness and that the Meyer information really doesn't use the word God. And when we're talking about the universal consciousness, we're talking about the intelligence that's driving the evolution of our universe. And one of the things that I love to talk about is Billy's writings on love because he talks about the love of creation. He says that the incredible splendor of nature is the visible expression of the love of creation and that creation radiates love. And uh, another thing he says is love is the highest principle in all creation and through it everything exists in absolute logic. Every tiny plant and every tiny animal fulfills its purpose in love. So could you comment a little bit on what the creation is and, 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 and how love fits into that and, and, and the, those sorts of things, Daniel? Yeah, well, in every problem is the solution. So every problem you look at honestly with yourself, you'll find the solution. And it's not always easy. And so, but it's, it's there. And if we're honest with ourselves, that's the thing, you know, people say, well, what do you, what do you, uh, what do you think about this bad thing about nature? You know, like here's a lion that bit it, you know, a creature's head off or something. Well, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's that's just the way it goes, man. Like, you know, um, it's the same thing as if I decide, you know, to go out for a walk in the middle of winter and it's 45 degrees Celsius or minus 45 degrees Celsius, I'm sorry, <laughs> which is, you know, bloody cold. And, um, <laughs> you know, you're, you you can feel your breath, you know, freezing when, you, when it comes into your body and so on. And so your eyelashes freeze and everything. But, you know, if you decide to go out naked, well, guess what happens? You freeze. So, you know, nature is just that and way. Regardless. And if you're, that's regardless. It doesn't matter if you're a millionaire or a billionaire or, you know, Jeff Bezos or anybody else. You know, we're, we're all in this ship together. And, uh, you know, I kind of like to... My, my my favorite analogy for the universe, I don't know if you ever did this when you were a kid in school, but I remember doing this thing one time, an art sort of project, where you kind of take a piece of paper, you take some crayons and you color different sections, just there's no drawing or anything, it's just you color different sections, different colors of the piece of paper, and then you paint it black over top. And then after it dries, mm. you can actually scrape away, you know, you can draw with a with a like a, a toothpick or something and you take you know your toothpick and you can draw a picture by scraping the paint away and then you have all the colors underneath well that's 
you know, if you take that analogy, you look at it in terms of each human being is like a person uncovering that toothpick, you know, un- uncovering what's underneath that, that, that black layer. That mm-hmm. what's underneath that black layer, you know, would be the same for every every living being in the universe. But we're all at different parts of that, you know, of that of that picture. And so eventually, if you keep scraping away at it, we'll all find the same answers. And so, um, you know, two plus two equals four in, in Iraq or in America or, you know, in Canada and Mars, <laughs> everywhere, you know. So it, it, that's once you can start thinking about the universe and holes and complete, you know, um, ultimate, you know, whole uh, answers like that. I don't know what the correct word is for that, but then you can start to piece things together. And so I don't know if you want to cover the the framework a little bit while we're on the show, because that might be useful for your listeners too. Um, The, Sure. That was kind of the process that I went through at the time, though. And um, what I started with, well, it it was a long story, but I'll start kind of, you know, where I started the actual framework. And so when I was actually looking for this case, um, where it would come public, you know, I would look for things that can be agreed upon by, by anybody. And it didn't matter if they were academics or you know, some, some grandma sitting in, in her house, you know, or whatever. So um, it's just sort of self-evident things that we can all sort of know. So um, so when I first started looking for where the case would be, uh, you know, I started to think about it in terms of what kind of politics would they want to um, bring their this case public in, because that would play a huge role if you did it in places that are very... Uh, against um, socially uh, democratic or um, social progressive uh, ideas or whatever, uh, then you'd have a very hard time to bring this kind of a case public without getting killed. So there are countries in the world that are still, you know, treating women like dirt and all this kind of stuff and everything else. And well, most countries still do, but um, it's, you know, like, uh, there are some more more than others, and uh, we know um, the only country in the world that actually has a direct democracy is Switzerland. They actually get to vote on issues four times a year. Oh, really? Issues, not people. Wow. Once every four years, they actually get to vote on issues four times a year. So that's different from any country in the world. It's the only true democracy that actually exists, and. Um, and then when you look at Switzerland, look at the, geog- the, the geographic location of it. It's mm-hmm. right at the center. So it's easy you know, enough for an Australian to get to, and it's easy enough for a Canadian or an American to get to. So whereas mm-hmm. for an American to get to Australia would be ridiculous. You know, it's like a huge undertaking, and so, or vice versa, and so on. So that's why these leaders meet in Switzerland and that's why the world wars happened, for example, in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, and so, uh, main reason anyways. And so, um, when you also look at, um, um, other aspects like, uh, the, their economic, um, system is very different. So they actually um, can keep criminals at on a leash, on a tight leash, because criminals know that they can protect their welfare. <laughs> that's why Hitler didn't invade Switzerland. So that's a very stable, stable country, and it doesn't matter, it seems like, what's going on in the world. Switzerland always seems to have this sort of monoto- mono- monotone sort of stability within it. And, well, um, let and me let me ask you a question real quick. You just said something mm-hmm. I, I don't think I completely understood. You said Hitler didn't invade Switzerland. Uh, why did Hitler not invade Switzerland? And again, remind us what we're talking about here when we're talking about Switzerland. In terms well, of Switzerland what you call is, this case. Is, right. 
this case, exactly. So this case would um, be brought out here because of its stability, um, socially and economically and, and so on and so forth, um, politically uh, in, in the sense that um, huge criminals and so on don't see a motive or they see an extreme motive not to invade Switzerland. Um, and it's partially for other reasons too, because in, the, in Switzerland you also have... Um, uh, well, a lot of it, let's just say, let's back up here for a second. A lot of the Nazi sort of criminal wealth was, you know, being probably kept in Switzerland. Um, <laughs> and so you also have that. But you also have the other aspect of it that every Swiss man joins the army for two years. And um, yeah. they they have bunkers enough to... Uh, hide in if there's ever like a huge catastrophe for the entire population of Switzerland. Um, you know, it's in the Swiss Alps, which is a huge advantage. Um, you know, um, they can blow up all their bridges and everything if they need to. Everything is ready to go. Um, like this is a very forward thinking country. Um, and then you think about it in terms of their, their intellectual ability. Einstein spent a lot of his time there. Uh, Carl Jung spent a lot of his time there. A lot of these really like the best thinkers in our in our time um in in recent centuries have spent a lot of their time in switzerland um because they put such huge emphasis on education and really practical education so even their high school students graduate to actually learn a real skill that they can then start making money with immediately um and it's so all paid for are you post secondary is paid for are you is paid for are you saying the play are in picked Switzerland because in many ways it was the most evolved place on the planet. Yeah, exactly. And you don't see this in any other country. Not even one of these um, um, characteristics can be found to compete with Switzerland, much less all of them put together So uh, in other countries. And so when you have Switzerland, it's just the most unbeatable choice. And... Um, and so that's just some aspects to why Switzerland. So when you actually get to the why in 1975, that goes into a little bit more detail, but um, maybe we can move on to that topic now because I don't know if you're ready to. What, what do you think? <laughs> well, it sounds like we could talk about this for a very long time. Uh, we've already <laughs> blown over our hour, which, and I really appreciate oh, I people that call in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, we're well over our hour, and I try to keep it to an hour. But uh, it's very, very interesting looking at this case from the perspective of your framework. And you went out and said, if there's going to be real extraterrestrial contact, it has to be like A, B, C, D, E, F. And and, mm -hmm. and and you found the Meyer case and that fulfilled A B C D E F all the way through Z, and you said, "Wow, mm -hmm. this is this is a real case." Now, yeah, it's one a real last case. Question. It wasn't just a theory in my head anymore. Go ahead. Right, 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 right. Why? And this is really interesting. Do you, have you ever looked into yourself as to why you even thought about an extraterrestrial intelligence? Well, it started actually when I was nine, um, because I was, like I said, completely surrounded by uh, religious, you know, people or very materialistic people, you know, at, at the bare minimum. And so it was um, really hard for me to use their information to, to make sense of the world. You know, I was still in really early on in school, and the teachers were telling me, if you don't do well in school, blah, 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 you know, the whole speech. And so... Mm -hmm. um, the everything just wasn't making sense. The economics, like I would look at the news, I was like, what the hell is going on in the world? Like it's just everything is just so ridiculous and so backwards. And you know, people are killing each other left, right, and center for this and that and the, whatever reason. And it's always you know religion in the end and whatever it might be, or just control, greed, and so on and so forth. And so, um, but yeah, when I was nine years old, I was sitting on my front lawn, and. Um, this was after already some considerable thought, you know, went into things <laughs> about our financial system and so on. Um, and, you know, studying or being very interested in, uh, you know, David Suzuki, for example, uh, who 
has a very good science show in Canada on TV. Um, that was my favorite TV show. So very objective, very useful information. Anyways, and so when I was nine years old, I was sitting on my front lawn, and um, I it was like maybe June or July, and uh, mm-hmm. I was just all of a sudden this realization came into my head, and I don't know where it came from. It just thought it was just I'm here to in this life to try and bring some sense back to things in terms of our relationship with the universe, with creation. And I don't know where that idea came from. It just, it was just a realization. It wasn't like a big aha moment or anything like that. It was just an inner knowing. And, uh, and so I thought about that for a while, you know, the weeks went by and then I started to call it the codex Because where would this kind of realization, for me, in my circumstances, where would this kind of realization be able to come from? It wasn't from my environment. You know, my parents weren't into that stuff. My sister, my all my friends, all their friends, all the pastors and teachers and everything else. You know, they weren't thinking like this. And so, for me, you know, I, I started to think about it in terms of the larger picture, you know, like, well, maybe we do have more than one life, you know, maybe we get to carry some of that information from previous lifetimes because this inner knowing was just overpowering. Like it was just so powerful. It was just there. Like I couldn't deny it. Like it was just so <laughs> fundamental to my being, to my, to my entire consciousness, you know, the way it functioned. And so Um, I started to think about it in terms of the word codex, you know, was the ultimate word that I came to because code was a little bit too conscious. It would require too much of a conscious decision to to grasp this information. So codex, you know, would be more subconscious, like it would be implanted at one point consciously, you know, in maybe in previous lifetimes or something, and then able to be sort of re- instated in in the thoughts as as lifetimes go on and so as a way to sort of keep track on this mission which is actually a very important um turning point for our history uh, in humanity so like we were saying with galileo and all that stuff and his way of thinking and uh scientific method and, and so on and so yeah that's kind of where it started and uh, i went to a ufo conference i thought the whole thing was a bunch of crap and uh i thought well you know all these people are just talking about in terms of what governments say, what CIA this says, and that intelligence dude and this intelligence dude and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, wow, there's, you know, sarcastically in my head, I was like, wow, you know, of course there's no, uh, you know, greedy interest in in any of these talks, you know, like (laughs) it was just ridiculous. So why were governments funding UFO research and all this kind of stuff? It just made no sense to me. And so, um, like, they had websites, even in Canada here, like, a website where you can, like, report UFO sightings and stuff. And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. And what's that all about, you know? And later I find out, like, yeah, they're doing it to find out information about their own programs, see how people react to them. And so, Hmm. um, and so, yeah, I just thought about it in terms of, like, the whole picture. Like, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to have to ignore everything that the UFO industry, I'll say, or dog and pony show, as Michael Horn calls it, uh, is doing, excuse me. And, um, and so, because it, it, it just, there was no evidence. It was always just stories. It was always just, you know, somebody said this and somebody said that. And yeah, hey, maybe it did happen. Maybe it did. I'm not going to say it didn't. But I wanted evidence evidence that I could test for myself. I wanted something physical, real, that I could see and test for myself to my own satisfaction. And I didn't see that anywhere in any of those cases. And this was like a, an 11 hour or something, you know, thing that I went to uh, here when I was like 11 years old. And so, um, yeah, so I started to think about, you know, where would be the ultimate case because the ultimate case, they wouldn't talk about it in the mainstream. They certainly wouldn't talk about it in ufology because it would reveal all of these government programs that are so corrupt and these religious you know, groups and so on that are so corrupt and so like just evil, you know, like trying to control everybody and everything and creating these wars. And that's the people that you see on the news every night and all that kind of stuff um, doing all this crazy things, you know. And, uh, and so I thought, well... 
you know, it's very unlikely that you'll see it in academia, for sure, because, you know, the whole point of the UFO um, thing, to me, just, it was so much of a joke that it had to be done on purpose, you know, like, it's just so ridiculous. So I thought, well, yeah, okay, so you won't find it in any of those avenues, <laughs> in academia, ufology, uh, certainly not in religious or, or government organizations or any anything like that. So NASA, all those SETIs and all this kind of stuff, like, I, as far as I was concerned, they were just there to drag people along. And um, because I knew that this case had already started because we, we wouldn't have survived this long with this much insanity without somebody saying, okay, hold on. <laughs> we got to, you know, take a little bit of initiative here to prevent, you know, these weapons programs or that weapon program and so on. Because uh, I had concluded already in my framework that by 1974, the nuclear program would have, um, they were probably very likely creating a, a super bomb that would have completely destroyed the planet. Later on, um, several years later, I did actually find a, a documentary uh, on Google, uh, uh, Google videos or something it was. I don't think it even exists anymore. Maybe it does, but I don't. Uh, anyways, and they were interviewing the people that were <laughs> part of this program. And I was like, wow, <laughs> are you kidding me? So, um, and they had their memories erased according to the contacts, um, the contact reports. And in that documentary, they were unable to talk about it. Like, it was just the weirdest thing. Like they were completely unable. Like they, not even just the on a moral grounds, but like it just seemed like they were they were, they couldn't mention anything about it. <laughs> it's just the weirdest thing. And I thought, wow, okay, that's a weird documentary. But hey, you know, like whatever. And uh, and so yeah, I found that. I I haven't found it since. You know, it's just one of those things that kind of ended up on uh, on the internet for a while, and then it just disappeared. So um, you know, it can probably be found somewhere, but. Uh, who knows? Hmm. And so there's all these wow. kinds of things, right? Like you, you can just put all this stuff together. So there's, there's just no way we would have survived without some intervention in that respect, because obviously uh, ETs would have some interest in preserving our solar system so that it doesn't destroy itself, because that would obviously create a chain reaction, destroying other solar systems around ours and so on and so forth, too. So there's all these things, you know, like you have to think about it in terms of the whole. You can't just think about it in terms of, oh, what do I get? You know, like, here's some money in my bank account. Woohoo, I'm so happy. Like, you know, you have to go way beyond that <laughs> and say to hell with all that stuff and just just think. Look at, at the stars. What are they telling you? Like, yeah, okay, there's things going on out there. <laughs> so... So, yeah. Anyways, I could continue, but uh, I guess we're over time, so maybe we should probably just uh, call it yeah. quits here for now. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you bring up a lot of very interesting points, particularly one thing that just jumped in my mind when you were saying ETs. Uh, we, we know that these are extraterrestrial humans, human beings, mm -hmm. and yeah, that our exactly. universe has has many, many human human beings out there on other worlds. And they're not these freaky, yeah. strange things that the the UFO community tries to depict them as, correct? Yeah, exactly. It's all fear-based, and it's either that or ridicule. You know, you find that in Hollywood. You know, it's either ridicule or fear that they try to push, you know, and especially in recent decades. And so that's done on purpose. You know, it's a, sort of a brainwashing of the masses, you know, the movie Alien, what's that all about? It's some monster that goes and destroys everything, and, you know, everyone's trying to kill it, and it kills a bunch of people, and all this kind of, you know, blah, 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 whatever. So it's just, you know, that's, it always Independence Day, monsters. remember that? Yeah, remember yeah. Remember the exactly movie Independence thing. It's an invasion, yeah, yeah. it's and an that, invasion. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, good for the box office, not so good for your brain. So, um yeah, so, you know, that's all this kind of stuff. And I'm glad Star Wars came out when it did. It came out around the same time that the Meyer Contacts came public. Uh, 1977 was uh, the year Star Wars first came out, I believe. And until mm -hmm. 1982, I think they, they finished the third one. And so, um, and then uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind and the movie E.T. was all in the, was that all in the early 80s? Or, um, I guess, uh, yeah. in, um, oh. the first... Close Encounters was uh, 1977 as well, I believe, but uh, ET was also in the in the 80s, and I think it was the early 80s, but I'm not sure, maybe mid 80s. But after that, things just kind of just went downhill completely in terms of you know 
um, being more neutral on that on that subject. And um, and so everything is all about you know ETs taking over the world or you know it's just some sort of joke or you know whatever it's just a humorous thing. It's one of the two, you know. And so scientists don't touch that subject because it's just the way it's handled is, in my opinion, so ridiculous that it, it has to be on purpose because nobody's that stupid. I mean, seriously. So I don't know. I just, uh, I yeah. I um, yeah. So yeah, I found the case years later after finishing the framework, and uh, it was a checklist. It was a checklist. So and it and it fit one A through Z as you say. So it worked really well. So I'll be publishing that uh, soonish, and um, you know people can read it whatever they want. You know I didn't really ever intend um, to publish it, and uh, it's kind of going against my modest operandi as, as they call it or whatever but uh because you know it's it's pretty challenging for people to think about it's you know i i don't expect that i'll be well treated for it that's for damn sure but uh you know it's another kind of galileo moment and uh it's galileo all over again you know and we're kind of at a stage where we're challenging huge aspects of our belief systems that our whole society is based on so so that's yeah. uh, very, 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 difficult very, very. To, uh, It's difficult to go against the flow, but it's destructive to go with the flow. So, <laughs> which is better, right? <laughs> so, if we keep yeah, going with yeah. the flow, we're going to completely Here's... annihilate ourselves. If if some of us at least go against the flow, then there might be some hope <laughs> that we don't completely annihilate ourselves. So, you know, it's either it's a catch twenty two. So, what do you do, right? So. All right, Daniel. So I'm I'm, I, I really appreciate you. I really appreciate you jumping in like this. Uh, I'm no notice whatsoever jumping in the show. It's been a great conversation. <laughs> well, thanks, Thank man. you. Thank you. Okay. Talk soon. <laughs> Bye-bye.